So in general, here is a quick summary of DNA replication, responsible for storage and transmission of hereditary information, it contains 46 chromosomes. Um, each chromosome is one molecule of DNA coiled around um, histone proteins, which are a basic positive charge. Keep in mind the phosphate groups um, that make up the DNA, or, uh, DNA backbone are negatively charged, so opposite charges attract. Um, so in this case right here, uh, we see an example of a double helix, which is coiled up around positively charged histones. Let me go and use my red pen. Here we see um, DNA double helix, which coils up around positively charged histones, opposite charge attract. Um, and these, in turn, coil around to make up the chromosomes. Um, individual sections of these chromosomes are the genes, fundamental units of hereditary, uh, heredity, where one gene equals one protein. Essentially what happens is um, if you want to make a specific protein, you're going to have to uncoil at the specific sections which um, contain the gene for coding for that one protein. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Right now, we're just going to be talking about DNA replication. So in DNA replication, yes, you have uncoiling. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the whole prophase, metaphase, anaphase, all that kind of stuff. At this point, all I'm going to talk about is um, the actual duplication of DNA strands during replication. So I'm just going to assume that we've uncoiled from the histones, exposing the double helix. Um, you can always assume that there are two um, strands, uh, one complementary, um, and they're both used in making a brand new um, DNA, um, or making the brand new um, DNA nucleotides for the brand new DNA strands. Um, so in this case, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So you see an example. Here we have our original parents in blue. And then in purple, we have our brand new daughter DNA strands that are formed. That's me trying to spell daughter with a, not doing a very good job. That too. Let me switch to my pen. So scratch that out. So the purple is actually the brand new daughter strands. So what's going to happen is, in a nutshell, the DNA is going to unwind. So if this is the two strands before, it's going to unwind actually within the middle of the DNA strand. So it looks something like this. So here is before, here is after where they're unwinding. And it's at this point where, um, let me go ahead and switch to a pin. So it's at this point that you start creating brand new daughter DNA, which will be, um, and you actually make the daughter DNA in fragments. And the fragments are then reconnected, are, are uh, connected together um, to form brand new daughter strands during the DNA replication. Notice I didn't give you really any detail about um, um, the joining of these fragments of DNA to, to create the daughter strands. 
Um, what we're going to do is focus on one specific part of DNA replication. And what I am going to do is expose you to the very, very beginning. It's right at the beginning when we start to create the brand new um, daughter molecules for the DNA strand, the uh, starting nucleotide fragments for the um, brand new daughter DNA strands. So just we're going to be focusing on one very, very specific part. And even then, it gets really complicated, so I'm going to summarize what you absolutely need to know for the um, quiz or exams. So in this case, I'm just going to focus on one specific part where I'm going to go from the coiled helix to the unwinding. I should probably use a different pen for the other one. to the unwinding and formation of what's called a replication bubble. Finally, I'll get into, after we get into the replication bubble, I'll get into the general crude steps for creating the brand new daughter strands of DNA. So a lot of my colors are starting to overlap, so that I know that can be confusing. Let's just go right into the examples. There are three stages at the very beginning of DNA replication. There's the unwinding of the DNA, there's the synthesis of the DNA, and finally there's um, the connection of specific parts of the DNA. And I'll get into this last step in a lot of detail later on. Finally, we skip a whole bunch of steps and just say that the new double helix forms. And it's like skipping whole letters of the alphabet going from A, B, C, Z. Um, step four, obviously, it's loaded with a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not going to touch upon. Uh, I am going to talk heavily about the very beginning, though, steps one, two, and three. So, first thing I need to go ahead and do is um, show you this picture right here. Here is a general summary of the DNA um, replication process. This is taken directly from the book. I don't like how they did this particular picture. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and rotate it. And I know the letters are going to be messed up. I'm going to rotate it like this. I'm then going to go ahead and flip it. There we go. So that way you can at least relate the slide to what I'm about to talk talk about right now. So let's go ahead and bring up my black pen. Um, so in this case, I know it's backwards, but I want to focus on uh, the uh, the graph itself. So in this case, um, we have. The parents, the parent is uh, both in purple and blue. So for the parent, um, on this side we have the three prime in for the parent, and we have the five prime in. Over here, because it's anti-parallel, we have a parent five prime to three prime. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to draw a, another picture below, and I'll start making changes as we go along. So in this case, here we go. So I use black and blue. Now 
Now, let's go ahead and go to one side. Here I have the three prime in. Here I have the five prime. And then in blue, it's anti-parallel again. So it goes from five prime to three prime. So keep in mind if if this uh, in this case if we're going to go from this direction five prime to three prime, then the other parent strand is going to be going the opposite direction. So I think I beat that to death. In step one, we have um, the unwinding of the double helix. So in step one, we have the unwinding. And basically, the enzyme involved is going to be an enzyme called helicase. should be easy to memorize. Helix, helicase. And hit's whole job, and I'll go ahead and I'll make this one in green. Its whole job is to go ahead and unwind the DNA. So, I'm going to go ahead and draw it as a little box. And I'm... Um, you're going to find something really interesting about these enzymes. As far as this class goes, all enzymes love going from 3 prime to 5 prime. All enzymes love going from 3 prime to 5 prime. So in this example right here, we're going to go ahead and go this direction. So here's before, and now I'm just going to go ahead and erase the section and draw the, whoa, and draw the after. So here is after where it traveled. Here's my black pen, and then I'm just going to go ahead and draw a really big replication bubble. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw my blue pen. And here's a really big replication bubble. So it moved to the right. I'm sorry, I, I can't do the animation properly. But it moved to the right. So here is my helicase. And it's going to the right. Uh, you can think of it as going from 3 prime to 5 prime. It gets more complicated, but at this point, this is where we go to the right. Um, now, you'll notice there's a giant fork in here. Uh, there's a giant bubble here. Um, the place where the bubble comes together, um, right where the helicase is at, we call this the replication fork. So here is the replication fork up here. Notice in the picture above, you don't see the actual enzymes. In reality, they're big and bulky, so sometimes they just show you the process, but they don't actually sh put in anything. Here I actually have a high-tech design where I, uh, the box represents the helicase. Um, so the big space in between is the replication bubble, and the edge where the helicase is unwinding, we call this the replication fork. Notice there are two forks on each side. One fork here, one fork over here. The beginning of the fork is where the helicase just started. The other side of the fork is where it continues on. Um, now, we have this giant space in between, and this 
creates our entry for our next big step. Our next big step in step two is um, the creation of the DNA um, daughter strands. This requires the enzyme DNA polymerase. So, let's go ahead and use a different color. So, DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase loves going from, and I'll just use a circle like this. DNA polymerase, it loves going, again, from 3 prime to 5 prime. So, notice on this top bubble, even though I have the arrow pointing in this direction, this side is the 3 prime end, this side is the 5 prime end. So, it's going to want to go from the 3 prime to 5 prime. So, what will happen is it will lock on to the open replication bubble, and it will travel along the replication bubble, going from the 3 prime end to the 5 prime end. And then it will start laying down the new daughter DNA tracks, if you will. We often call the top strand the leading strand and the bottom strand the lagging strand in reference to the DNA polymerases and whether they go toward or against the helicase. Before we get into the bottom lagging strand, let's first focus on the top leading strand. Follow the helicase. So as new um, So as, uh, as the helicase opens up new portions of the replication bubble, the um, DNA polymerase on this top strand will follow in the same direction and basically will um, follow the leader, so to speak. Now, here's the hard part. If this is the 3 prime in and this is the 5 prime in on the... Um, alternate strand, and we are limited. DNA polymerase must always, always, always go from 3 prime to 5 prime. What will happen is it will start going in the opposite direction of the helicase, which is referred to as the lagging strand. So, um, and eventually it will stop. Why? Because it hits the edge of the replication fork. So, it now laid down a nice piece, but now it can't continue on because it's going in the opposite direction of the unwinding helicase. So, Let's go ahead and go forward a bit in the future. So the Gila case opens up even more. My other daughter strand. There you go. So now I've made the replication bubble really big. Here is my helicase. Notice it's still going down here. And you notice over time, not much happens with the top DNA polymerase. So notice these are two separate DNA polymerases, one on each of the um, one on each of the different strands. And let me just go ahead and continue drawing this top one using a different color. So notice how it just keeps on going. The bottom one, however, 
this particular DNA polymerase, however, has to get off. And what it'll do is it will actually get off the bottom DNA strand, swim over to another portion of the open uh, replication bubble, and then lock back on to the um, bottom DNA strand, at which point it will then double back and continue leading a strand. You'll see this happening over and over. Here is the DNA polymerase after. And the same thing will happen again. When it gets close to the previous DNA strand that it laid down, um, notice this right here, this previous, and it's just a fragment. We call these Okazaki fragments. So these are the Okazaki fragments. So when it bumps into its previously laid down DNA molecule Okazaki fragment, it has to pop back off again. And then it continues to travel along again. So it's constantly double backing. And it stops just before it reaches its previously laid down DNA. Um, now, the top one has no problem. The top DNA continues to form um, continuously. It's the bottom one that we need to worry about. Why? Because we still have these fragments right here that need to be filled in. So this brings us to step three. And you need to fill in the NICs. Using a uh, third type of enzyme called DNA ligase. 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 So I'm going to go ahead and make my DNA ligase in... Uh, I'll make it in this color right here. And I'll make it as a triangle. And what DNA ligase does is it comes along and it fills in the NICs. So now you have two newly forming um, daughter DNA strands. And once those NICs uh, filled in, then, um, then the bottom strand is going to be complete. It's no longer going to be an Okazaki fragment. It will actually be a um, fragment of a, uh, of a new daughter DNA strand. So if we take a look at this picture up here, here we see the um, top strand, bottom strand, um, the helicase. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, erase all of this. Um, so we take a look at the very top one, even though I have it backwards. Um, I like it, drawing it this way since it matches what I just talked about. So over here we have the helicase. Um, we have the top DNA strand. Notice the DNA polymerase is going to go ahead and follow the helicase in this direction. So it's always follow the leader. The bottom one, however, the, the bottom DNA um, like uh, DNA, excuse me, the bottom DNA polymerase, however, is going to have to constantly get off and get back on. Consequently, it creates the Okazaki fragments, and therefore we need a third type of enzyme on this bottom DNA, newly forming DNA strand called DNA ligase. And the DNA ligase fills in the mix of the Okazaki fragments 
creating a creating a brand new piece of um, daughter DNA strand. So now we have two newly forming daughter DNA strands. I know it can be confusing because technically these daughter DNA strands, these are fragments on its own. But when I mean Okazaki fragments, these are really small pieces and they remain Okazaki fragments until the DNA ligase fills in the next. In which case you can think of these at this level of of uh, what we're getting into. Um, you can think of these as two new daughter DNA strands. And we skip straight to step step four where they magically come off and I'm sorry, we skipped straight to step four. That wasn't put word that wasn't worded correctly. We skipped straight to step four where the unwinding continues on and um then you have two brand new double helixes. One with the parent, one with the DNA. So that's my crude picture of a parent and DNA. I'm sorry, parent and daughter DNA. Parent and daughter DNA. So here's before, parent and daughter, parent and daughter. Now you have the parent and daughter DNA. The problem with this method is that when you're doing this replication, you're actually starting in the middle of the DNA. You don't start at the very end. The good thing about the method is you can actually speed up this process because you can have simultaneous um, replication forks. So here are our two replication, I'm sorry, two replication bubbles. So notice on these two replication bubbles, um, yes, yeah, so you can actually speed up the DNA replication process because you can have multiple DNA strands, daughter DNA strands forming and eventually everything will separate. The bad news is um, on the very edges of the, or the tips, the DNA replication process is not going to work properly based on what we've talked about up here. Consequently, you actually lose some DNA at the very edge. Um, nature accounts for this by creating additional repeating units. Um, of DNA called telomeres. And then the more the DNA is replicating, then the edges of the telomeres um, start to degrade. That's one way they've accounted for the program death process of a cell, because when the telomeres run out, then you no longer have proper uh, DNA replication, and then the cell dies. On the other hand, if there's a really important cell, then you have special enzymes which actually um, add new um, or add fresh new telomere tips to the existing telomeres. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Bottom line is in stage four, you have a parent and daughter, brand new parent and daughter once these nicks are filled in, and they separate and we never get into any of the other processes why because we just don't have the time so um, with multiple uh, replication forks all occurring um, it takes less than three minutes to do complete DNA replication um, that's pretty fast so that's one advantage the other types of RNA, now we're switching gears here. RNA, we have messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. Um, during transcription, you go from DNA to and you actually go to messenger RNA. There's another step involved, but um, this is the type of um, 
crude biodegradable um, RNA, or RNA that is actually produced, which is um, sent to the protein making factory. Ribosomal RNA. These are um, RNA which is embedded in the protein making factories. The protein making factories are called ribosomes. So this is what a ribosome looks like. Um, so think of ribosomes as the factory. Ribosomal RNA is RNA which is actually embedded into the um, ribosome factory, which helps facilitate um, the protein synthesis. Now, just because you have a blueprint and you have a factory, what you actually also need are the amino acid supplies in order to make your desired um, protein product. So, um, in order to transfer the protein product, you need special um, transportation vehicles. So, transfer RNA, these are the trucks which basically carry in the amino acids into the uh, protein building factory ribosomes. So there's one type of tRNA for each of the 20 amino acids. Um, so, well, technically there's a little bit more than that, but we're not going to get into that. Um, but know that they're used to truck in amino acids during protein synthesis, aka translation. This is what a um, a uh, transfer RNA looks like. It's T-shaped, and it's actually a piece of RNA which is double-backed on itself um, in order to f form its shape. Um, this side right here is actually the site that um, that binds um, to the um, ribosome. Technically, it doesn't just bind to the ribosome. It actually binds to the messenger RNA within the ribosome. So I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to get into that until we start getting into translation. Um, and then, so think of this as the cab of the truck. This over here is the trailer hitch where you're going to have a esterification and it's going to go ahead and um, bond to the C-terminus end of your amino acid. So for example, it forms a esterification on the carboxyl end, C-terminus end. So let's say if this was a cysteine, for example, then it would be bonded to the carboxyl end um, of the cysteine. Key differences, we've already talked about these between DNA and RNA, but it's helpful, especially if I ask you to write a single strand DNA and RNA, and I give you the letters. Um, one key difference is DNA is always double-stranded, whereas RNA is always a single strand. There's no reason to have a, a um, carbon copy of RNA since it's very short-lived. Another big difference is it is short-lived. So short-lived meaning once it's made, it lasts about an hour before it starts to degrade or um, chewed up by uh, garbage collecting enzymes, um, by recycling enzymes, actually. Long-term lasts the life of the cell. Um, another big difference is ribonucleic acid. The hydroxyl group is present, or the oxygen in, is present, so you have an alcohol on the second prime carbon. Notice over here there is no oxygen. Another big difference is um, when it comes to um, thymine. For DNA, it contains thymine, 
and notice there's the methyl cap. Whereas RNA, there is no methyl cap. So the proper name for that um, for that base is a uracil. So in summary, DNA only contains thymine, and RNA only contains uracil. And these are important structural differences, so that way enzymes know which nucleic acids to chew up and which ones to ignore. So here's a nice summary of what we just talked about. And um, RNA is present in the nucleus, cytoplasm, and mitochondria. Um, DNA obviously is predominantly present only in the nucleus. Um, let's see, everything else we've talked about, so this will be a good stopping point.